As you look at the screen behind me, you can see the title of the lesson, The Fool's Philosophy of Life, and you also see a Bible reference there. And there is something about that word fool that I ran across in Matthew 5, verse 22, that always bothered me. I remember when I ran across that and I thought, well, I'm so uncomfortable using that word fool now. You look at that text in Matthew 5, 22, and if you're like me, when you run across that, and it says, whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell, it makes you never want to use that word. Yet that's a real Bible theme. There's a lot of Bible teaching about the fool and about folly and about foolishness, and so it occurs quite often in the Bible. I, I found that word several times, uh, 105 times, fool or the plural fools, 105 times in my translation of the Bible. And then you have other words that are connected to it, like foolish, foolishness, and so on. Another 88 times, I found the word folly. Uh, another uh, 35 times or so. So there's a Bible theme in teaching about the difference between wisdom and folly in a fool and a wise man. So there's something we need to learn about that. We're going to use that word a lot when we study that subject in the Bible. But that one in Matthew 5 always made me uncomfortable with it. And if you are like me, it made you uncomfortable too. There's something different going on in Matthew 5, verse 22, than there is in other places in the Bible that discuss that word. In Matthew chapter 5, there's a warning about what's going on in our hearts toward other people. And if you look at the full text of Matthew chapter 5, you realize that's a section talking about not committing murder. And the things that go on internally inside of us when we're building up that hatred and that bitterness toward another person and using that word fool toward them in that line of reasoning, that's the warning. That when you start talking about someone, and that's a word that just sort of dismisses them as a person and they become a throwaway person in your mind, they're not worth your time or effort, and it's almost like judging their heart as though they're not worthy of life itself and making them a castaway. And it has to do with building up this animosity toward committing murder. So there's a warning in Matthew 5 about that. But it's not a secret word that if you use that word, somehow you've committed some great error you can't come back from. It's not, it's not like that. Some people read that into a text about, um, about uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit in that kind of thinking. That Could you say some secret word against the Holy Spirit? You'd be lost forever. You'd be beyond redemption. And you could never come back from it. It's not about using a secret word. It's about an attitude. It's about a frame of mind. And as long as you continue in that, you're in grave danger. Well, the same is with the word fool and how you're using it towards someone. And uh, it's not the way we would normally use it today. Oh, stop being a fool. We might say that and not mean anything as mean or ugly as Matthew 5.22 in the context there. But when you get to the Bible teaching about that, there's identifying the character of one who's playing the role of the fool. The character of that person, the lifestyle of that person, the way they think and the way they behave. And it's giving us a choice between a life of wisdom and a life of folly. So it's laying that out for us and describing it so that we can tell the difference and then make the right kind of choice with it. So folly is the opposite of wisdom and the fool is the opposite of the wise person. And the distinction between the two is one's going to heed the word of God. One's going to listen carefully to that and observe it in their life and the other one is not. And you run across that description in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 24 through about verse 27, where you have the wise man who builds his house on the rock and the foolish man who builds on the sand. And the discussion in Matthew 7 is about all the teaching that Jesus has been doing, and he's telling everybody, this is the end of the discourse. And you're either going to be a wise man or a foolish man. You will heed my words and heed my teaching and start observing them in your life, obeying the word of God, or you will not. And that's the distinction between the wise and the foolish. Now I'm going to give you an illustration. And uh, this is one you'll be familiar with. 
if you watch any television, even listen to the news, you've heard about a police sketch where someone has observed some crime. They were an eyewitness to some deed that was done, and the police come up to this person and they say, well, you saw this individual. Can you tell me what he looked like? Could you sit down with our police sketch artist and could they make a composite sketch based on your description of this person? Tell us what he looked like. And they'll make that sketch and they might put it out in a newspaper. They might put it on the TV news. You might see it on social media. And we're looking for this person. Keep your eyes open. If you see them, don't approach them. Call 911. And so we're familiar with the police sketch. And what the Bible is doing for us, especially in the book of Proverbs, you find the words for fool, foolishness, folly, you find those a lot in the book of Proverbs. And the book of Ecclesiastes sort of reinforces that teaching. So you have these two books in what we have named as wisdom literature. And they're giving a composite sketch in words of the fool and his folly. It looks like this. This is what this character looks like. This is how this person behaves and how they walk through life. And so you begin looking at that information and you have this eyewitness testimony in wisdom literature, book of Proverbs mainly, about this kind of individual. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to be like that person. You want to be different from them. And one of the things you read about them is they're rather angry and they're arrogant, and they're self-centered. We studied this morning in Bible class about Nabal, and he was very much like that. He was a man of folly. He fit the description. He was an angry man, and he was arrogant, and he was self-centered. That was just like Nabal in our Bible class this morning. So in Proverbs 14, verse 17, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. They are people with a temper that flares up rather easily. When you run into someone and they're always having some kind of a tantrum or a temper flare, that's a mark of foolishness, and we ought not to be like that. Proverbs 14, 29, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. And something else we find about the description of the fool in the book of Proverbs, they enjoy quarrels. They like fights. They're seeking them out. Proverbs 20, verse 3, Keeping away from strife is an honor for a man, but any fool will quarrel. And something else we find out about the character of the fool is that they, they trust in their own knowledge. They are very reluctant to take any advice from anybody. They don't want to listen to anybody. They are their own source of wisdom, and they trust in that, and that's the way they go through life. Proverbs 12, verse 15, The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Not only is the fool right in his own eyes, but in Proverbs 26, verse 5, they're wise in their own eyes. I'm right and I'm wise in my own eyes. I don't care what you have to say about it or any advice or counsel you have to give. doesn't matter to me. I know everything. That is a mark of the foolish person. They even reject guidance from their own parents. And maybe that's the beginning of the problem, is that that wasn't corrected early in life. And they grew up that way. Proverbs 15, verse 5, A fool rejects his father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. They're just the kind of person, they, they don't practice much self-discipline, self-control over their emotions and their actions. In Proverbs 12, 23, a prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of, fool, of fools proclaims folly, and their life is dotted by lack of control in a lot of areas. The use of their words is one of those areas. Proverbs 10, verse 14, Wise men store up knowledge, but with the mouth of the foolish, ruin is at hand. They're just constantly 
chattering about all sorts of things, and they don't know as much as they think they do, and they're not only leading themselves to ruin, but that of other people. You develop that pattern of the fool, and you, you see a life that's on a self-destructive course. And so the warning is, don't be like that. Be like wisdom. Listen to wisdom. Listen to good counsel. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Observe the will of God in your life and those who honor God. One of the most developed images of folly and the fool is going to be found in Proverbs 9. And it describes two women in that chapter. One of the women is Lady Wisdom. And she builds her house, and she sets her table, and she gives an invitation for all to come. That's, that's the first six verses of Proverbs 9. This is Lady Wisdom. She's prepared her table, her house, and she invites everybody to come in to feast on wisdom. But then in the same chapter following that, you have another woman in that chapter. And this one is the woman of folly. And she's depicted as a seductress. She is a loose woman, loose morals, and she's of that nature and that kind. So these two women, one is wisdom and one is folly. And the woman of folly, this seductress, this loose woman, she tempts those who come by. She tempts them with stolen water and she tells them bread eaten in secret is just wonderful. She's seducing them to come into her house of folly. And then she lures in the unaware in verse 16. And in verse 18, when they come into her, she kills them. That is quite a picture between wisdom and folly in Proverbs 9. So that's our police sketch, as it were, of the fool and the folly that marks his life. Now we're coming down to Ecclesiastes 10.19, and I've labeled this one the riddle. This one will throw you, if you read it by itself, this is the fool's philosophy of life, but if you read it all by itself, it, it throws you a little bit because you don't understand the context of it. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment. You think, yeah, a meal, enjoyment, that's right. We enjoy ourselves at meals. We like potlucks. We like supper time. We like lunch. We like to go out to eat. And so, yeah, you, you, you prepare a meal for enjoyment. And then it goes on to say, wine makes life merry. Well, that's right. Boy, if you drink wine, you'll be happy. If you drink wine, it makes you smile, makes you laugh. I've seen people uh, all the time, they, they drink a little wine or some alcoholic beverage and, and they're happy and they're joking with each other and they're singing songs together and, well, that, that's right. And money is the answer to everything. Well, you know, that, that seems right. Money is the answer to everything. If you have enough money, if you could throw money at a problem, the problem will go away. Well, you listen to that and you realize there's something about it that doesn't ring true. If you read it that way all by itself, it, it looks like maybe it starts to make sense, but then you realize this can't be right. There's something awry. There's something off here because that's not Christianity. That's not the Christian life. So there's something wrong with Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 19. But when you read the whole chapter, you realize this is a chapter contrasting the foolish with the wise. And all of a sudden it starts to make more sense. This is the foolish side. This is talking about the philosophy of life of the fool. This is how a fool approaches life and what they think about it. And so this is what a fool does in contrast to a wise person. The first four verses of that chapter talks about the influence of foolishness. Let me just read a verse or two of that. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. One goes the right way, one goes the wrong way. 
and you think about a, a, a perfumer's oil. It's supposed to be wonderful smelling. It's to be great, like an incense. But boy, you know, if dead flies get in that, it doesn't take much, and it'll ruin that. It'll, it'll turn it into a real stench. And that's the influence of foolishness. You can have a lot of wonderful things going on, but if you start mixing in the philosophy of the fool, you start getting that involved in it, and that life will begin to stink. It'll ruin everything. There's the influence of the fool. It matters who you hang around with. It matters what voice you listen to. And it matters if you, if you generally practice good, wise things, but then you mix in some foolishness. It'll ruin everything. The influence of foolishness. And then you get down to verses 5 through 7, and you find out that a society will crumble when something happens. When you begin to exalt the fool into places of power and authority, and you begin to suppress the wise and push them down out of those places, any society will crumble. I wonder if, if some of that's happening in our land. I mean, I'm, I don't preach politics, but when we start exalting foolishness, and start listening to that voice and giving that power and authority, a society will crumble. And boy, is our society crumbling in so many ways. And so we need to be very cautious with that and think about what's happening. But that is, that's the word in verses 5 through 17. You'll ruin a place, you'll ruin a community when you exalt the fool to these places of authority and you suppress the wise. You get down to verses 8 through 11 and you find out one of the marks of foolishness is they, they just don't plan well. They don't think ahead. They don't look down the road. They don't consider. So we need to be wise in that way. We need to think about it. Here's verse 10. If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. So you're getting ready to go chop some wood, chop down a tree, whatever it is, your ax is dull. You realize how hard you're going to have to work at that? You're going to have to exert a lot of energy and a lot of work to get that job done. But if you put a little thinking into it and a little planning and preparation, you'll sharpen the ax first. And the idea is those who practice foolishness, those who promote that, they're not the sharpest tool in the shed. And if you follow that, you're going to have a life that's going to be a whole lot of effort and not a whole lot of, of good coming from it. Get down to verses 12 through 14, and the mouth of the fool doesn't have a governor. It's just endless chatter about things they don't know and stirs up strife and problems. And then you get down to verses 15 through 19, and that's where we find our riddle verse in verse 19. It's talking about the work ethic and the attitude of the fool. And part of their approach to life is there in verse 19. And here's the way the fool thinks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment. And wine makes life merry. And money is the answer to everything. But those are band-aids over a broken life. Those are temporary fixes over a life that's gone the wrong direction. And so you have these temporary things that fade away rather quickly, and it looks like it's going to be the answer. Well, if you've got enough money, if you have food to eat on the table, if you have wine on the table with you, you'll feel better. Well, for the moment, maybe. But it doesn't fix anything. And money's not the answer to everything. Those who are wise will find the Bible answer to those things. So rather than a meal for enjoyment, the faithful are filled with laughter and joyful shouting when they are restored to their rightful place with God. Here's the text for you. We're in Psalm 126. And this is a psalm about those who are coming back out of captivity and they're being restored to their rightful place with God. And verse 2 says, Then our mouth was filled with laughter, <clears throat> and our tongue with joyful shouting. 
Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. So rather than a meal for enjoyment, how about getting your life right with God? and realizing how wonderful God is and how He blesses our life and has done good for us, and finding our, uh, that our mouth is filled with laughter in realizing that, and our tongue with joyful shouting, realizing that, getting life back on track with God. For us, that would be redemption from sin and living the righteous life provided by God in Christ for us. Rather than wine to make one merry, in Ecclesiastes 10.19, rather than wine to make one merry, how about finding rejoicing in the heart in keeping the precepts of the Lord? Psalm 19, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the answer to everything is not perishable money. As a matter of fact, you'll read in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, not to fix our hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19, we were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold. Money's not the answer to everything, and it certainly won't answer the need of the soul. It won't direct our way to heaven. We were redeemed with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So we have this choice that confronts every person. And it's really rather simple. When you see this picture and develop this picture of folly and the fool and you come across the root cause, you understand the choice that's in front of you. Psalm 14 and verse 1, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. And that's the root cause of the problem. Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. But those who fear the Lord, they'll learn. They'll become wise. They'll live the life that he's designed for human beings to live. We find the choice in the New Testament described in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, about verse 18 down through the end of that chapter. Paul talks about the gospel that he's preaching. And he describes the way the world thinks in contrast with the gospel message that he preaches. Verse 18, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And then in verse 21, he states that God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message. That's the way the world thinks about it. Through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And in verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So it's the gospel itself, what the world considers foolishness. It's through that message preached. It's wiser than the so-called wisdom of the world. And it's the way of eternal life. So when the Apostle Paul finally realized that, Saul of Tarsus, Ananias simply said to him, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he did. And then later penned those words in 1 Corinthians as he shared the message with others who needed to hear it. Sometimes people think that, Oh, all this church and Bible stuff is just a waste of life. And what I'm saying is I'd like you to reconsider. If you thought about church and you thought about Bible and Bible study and all the effort and all the time you put into that, that's just a waste of life. It's a waste of time. I'd rather be doing something else. I'd like you to reconsider. There is the way of the fool and the life of folly and the way that it ends. And it's not good. And eventually... Those who live that kind of life will find that to be true. And I'm asking you to reconsider and devote yourself to God, to His people, His church, 
and to the study of his word and changing your life accordingly. And tonight, the words that Ananias gave to Saul of Tarsus may be words that you need to answer. Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. That's how we call on the name of the Lord. And if you need to answer that invitation tonight, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.